What's the truth about the world's most expensive main battle tank, France's Leclerc? For starters, the only way it was ever able to be produced in the first place was thanks to an international web of bribery and intrigue, which ultimately led to Leclerc ending up in combat in Yemen against Houthi rebels. But we'll get into that whole can of worms later. The Leclerc's new XLR upgrade program will be a part of the massive $400 billion defense modernization budget that will transform France's army by the year 2030. Wow, Leclerc, you've really changed and matured over the summer. And keep in mind, this analysis will be more accurate than usual, thanks to the Leclerc's classified manual being leaked on the War Thunder forum by a crew member. He did it because the turret rotation speed in-game wasn't accurate enough. Fair enough, that would bother me enough to risk going to prison for too. Fire off a French tank round at the like and subscribe button and let's get started. I happen to notice that you guys in the comments section have a lot to say about goat guns. No wonder Xi Jinping bought a goat gun. Do the cops still blast you if they kick in your door and you wake up and grab your goat gun? Uh, yes, my father and I both got my son a goat gun for his birthday this year, and it was funny, neither of us knew what we were getting him. I robbed a 7-Eleven with my non-firing goat gun. If you spice up your apartment with goat guns, they're guaranteed to start a heated debate about the Second Amendment with your mother-in-law. And with over 15,000 five-star reviews, rest assured you won't be disappointed. I want to show you behind-the-scenes footage inside the top-secret goat guns laboratory. Carl over there is in charge of research and development. Thank you, I just finished manufacturing a gold-plated AK-47. This one's very popular with our drug dealers, warlords, and dictators. But for those of you who are more straight-edge, we have a one-third scale non-firing AR with Master Key Shotgun. This one's popular with our SWAT teams that arrest the guys with the AKs. You can support the channel by clicking the link below to grab some awesome non-firing replicas today. The origins of the Leclerc can be traced back to 1789 with the invention of the guillotine. Wait, no. Wrong French weapon. The tank traces its roots to the 1970s, when France decided to replace their old AMX-30, which was seen as inferior to the Soviet Union's brand new T-72 tank at the time. In 1986, France's Directorate of Land Armaments ordered work on the Leclerc tank project immediately. The DGA, as it's called, is the French government's defense procurement and technology agency, responsible for program management, development, and purchase of weapon systems for the French military. French generals envisioned the Leclerc as an upgrade to the existing AMX-30 tank philosophy, which prioritized speed instead of armor, weighing only 40 tons. The AMX-30, for instance, had only 80 millimeters of armor, as opposed to their contemporary American M47 patent that had 240 millimeters of armor. The French reasoning was that the anti-tank weapons technology was advancing at such a fast rate that slower, heavily armored tanks would be more vulnerable than lighter, faster ones. Fast forward to today, and modern warfare may be proving their theory correct. The way military design works in France is interesting, because the Directorate of Land Armaments also supervises engineering schools that operate under the scrutiny of the Ministry of Defense. So this means the high-level military staff of the DGA are themselves armament engineers. So the people making the tanks understand tank engineering. It's brilliant. The French defense company that developed Le Leclerc was the relatively new Giad Industries, which is now known as Nexter Systems. Giad Industries was a state-owned enterprise and came from the amalgamation of several different defense firms which allowed new developments to take place under one company. The domestically produced FAMAS rifle is the most iconic design from Giad Industries, but nearly all of France's current armored vehicles also originates from them. Why is so much of France's defense equipment produced domestically? It might seem strange since, at the time, in the late 1980s, France was in a serious economic recession, with the average growth having shrunk from 3% in the 1970s down to 1.6% in the 1990s. Now, it might seem counterintuitive to spend on building a tank during hard times, but it actually creates jobs and reinvests money directly into France's own economy. However, Giad Industries still struggled to turn a profit and operated at a loss for many years. There are a lot of headlines about how the Leclerc main battle tank is the world's most expensive tank ever produced, but that's actually a little bit of a deceptive claim. The total number of Leclerc tanks purchased is much smaller than others like the American M1 Abrams. So for example, between 1992 to 2008, 826 Leclerc tanks were produced in total for France and foreign exports. 
Meanwhile, over six times as many M1 Abrams were produced for the United States Army alone. If France would have been able to produce a larger number of Leclerc tanks, then it would have made the overall cost per unit much smaller and thereby cheaper. This is simply because of how economies of scale work. So to put it into a way that even I can understand, the same principle applies when I buy 200 frozen burritos in bulk from Walmart, I pay less than when I buy one frozen burrito. This is why the Leclerc has gained the somewhat undeserved infamy of being an overpriced tank. In fact, the Leclerc would have been technically even more expensive or possibly impossible for France to produce if they hadn't secured a foreign export deal with the United Arab Emirates. They sold them 436 tanks, nearly half of the amount produced. In April 2004, the board of directors of Giot Industries presented the French public with a financial statement showing a profit of several hundred million euros. Ta-da, we made money. But how? How were we able to do that after years of financial problems? This is where the Leclerc French tank was involved in a bit of international scandal and tomfoolery. The French military industrial complex turned to an Arab businessman named Youssef to secure a $3 billion Leclerc tank deal to export to the United Arab Emirates. The whistleblowing platform WikiLeaks published a document that pulls the curtains back on rarely seen world of international arms trades. The document shows the sales commission for Youssef on the purchase was $235 million, or about 6.5% of the deal. Youssef then reportedly gave some of that money to UAE officials. So basically the accusation here is the French defense company Giat bribed the UAE to purchase 436 of their tanks for $3 billion. Keep in mind, Prior to the year 2000, it wasn't illegal in France to bribe foreign officials, so none of this was really a problem at the time what they were doing. But enough about the not so pretty process of how the sausage gets made. How does the Leclerc fare in battle? Because interestingly, this international deal is what led to the French Leclerc's baptism of fire. It was reportedly engaged in combat when the UAE sent 70 Leclercs to Yemen. In early August 2015, the Leclerc tanks rolled down Yemen's N1 highway straight to Al Anad Air Base. Their mission orders were to help the government troops beat back the Houthi rebels. It was reported that out of all the tanks that were attacked, only one was knocked out after being hit by a Soviet-style 9M113 missile that cost the life of the driver and injured the commander. This was the only reported loss of life, and the same Leclerc was able to be repaired after the attack. In regards to the armor of the Leclerc, it's important to understand that the French place a greater emphasis on active armor instead of passive armor. This is why even the heaviest version of the Leclerc weighs less than 58 tons, and currently features a modular armor system of high-density titanium inserts, tungsten, semi-reactive layers, and ERA blocks. Stefan Ferrardo, who is a military historian and French journalist, stated in his book that over its 60 degree frontal arc, the tank should be able to withstand multiple impacts of armor piercing ammunition belonging to the largest caliber currently available on the market. So the idea is that it's meant to stop tank and auto cannon rounds in the front. During one month, three tanks were damaged, two by anti-tank mines and one by an RPG, which damaged the grid without piercing the hull zero Leclerc tanks were destroyed. The battle lasted only a few days and ultimately ended with the Yemen government declaring victory over the rebels. This victory was in part thanks to Leclerc's excellent offensive capabilities. It has a French designed and produced Giat 120mm smoothbore cannon. Unlike the more common Rheinmetall RH120, the Giat has a caliber length of 52 as opposed to the more common 44. As you know, more bigger and more expensive equals more better. -er. This gives the tank a higher muzzle velocity of 1,790 meters per second, as opposed to the 1,500 meters per second found on the shorter cannon. While the cannon is longer, it's still compatible with this standard 120 by 570 NATO tank rounds that it's reported to have better characteristics when using armor piercing rounds thanks to the additional length. However, what is most unique and possibly will be copied by other Western nations is the Leclerc's use of an autoloader. While common in the Russian and Asian tanks, France chose to go with an autoloader because they expected to be outnumbered by Russian armor or even Middle Eastern nations that hold loads of old T-72s. Hypothetically, this solution allowed the Leclerc to fire at six separate targets within one minute, 
all while stabilized and on the move. Sadly, a tank size beret has not happened. Another major difference with the French autoloader is that the tank can be reloaded while under armor. Normally, you see Russian tanks and Western tanks needing to be fed new rounds through the top of the tank. In the Leclerc, two barcode readers identify the introduced ammunition in order to manage its position in the conveyor belt at any time. The fresh rounds are sent through a port in the inner bulkhead located to the right of the driver's position. This gives the Leclerc turret a lower profile and reduces the tank's crew to three. The autoloader in question is of course a French design and had 22 rounds at the ready with another 18 located in a separate compartment of the tank. Unlike Russian autoloader designs, the ammo is stored in an isolated compartment with blowout panels on top of the tank, meaning there's less of a threat of the turret blasting off. The Leclerc has a fully stabilized cannon with a 90% first hit probability at 4,000 meters while traveling at 30 miles per hour. This is the secret sauce for why Western tanks outperform Soviet tanks. It's not the armor or the autoloader, it's the fire control system. French tactics dictate design. France is famous for deploying light 4x4 vehicles inside of tank platoons. French tank platoons each have four lightweight cars called VBLs and uh, four Leclerc tanks associated with them. The VBLs are deployed as a reconnaissance vehicle to relay information back to the tanks. This kind of tactic would likely not work in a heavier US armored combat brigade team. So the findings in the field in the battle in Yemen was that the Leclerc had issues. The dust and gravel found in Yemen caused misfires in the machine guns and more than expected wear and tear on the tracks. While this may sound like the Leclerc is bad, Saudi Arabia did lose a considerably higher amount of Abrams in the same conflict. While it likely boils down to tactics, it does show the Leclerc held its own in this conflict and was adequate for the role. Another reason why France chose to develop the Leclerc is because of the unique way the French ground forces are structured. France's fighting doctrine is built around having the most advanced weapons technology to make up for their relatively speaking small number of vehicles and forces and less manpower. This is why the theory of decentralized and highly maneuverable small units moving about in multiple directions backed by just-in-time logistics is supported by retired French general Guy Hubin. This has caused the French to bet completely on a high-tech, fast-moving force in smaller numbers. However, War on the Rocks pointed out that this philosophy of high-quality tanks in low numbers might be perfect for counterinsurgency wars in like Africa and the Middle East, but might be less suited for conventional warfare. So France only has about 200 operational clerk tanks. That's kind of a disadvantage for two reasons. One, they don't have enough extra tanks to spare to lend out to allies like Ukraine. And two, it might not be enough equipment in a conventional war where you have to deal with attrition. Under the hood is a V8X 1500 hyperbar diesel engine that's fitted with a high pressure gas turbine, which produces 2,500 RPMs and allows the Leclerc to travel at 70 kilometers per hour. The engine gives it one of the best power to rate ratios among Western tanks. 27 HP per ton, and makes it one of the fastest main battle tanks of its generation. Zero to 32 kilometers per hour in five seconds. I can see the next Fast and Furious movie already. With the new upgrade package, France projects the Leclerc to be used up until 2040 and shows how their initial investment isn't going to waste. What is supposed to replace the Leclerc will be a joint venture between France and Germany as the manufacturer of the Leopard 2, Kraus Maffei Wagman merged with France's Nexstar Systems. Both nations are currently working on a new tank program, currently known as the Main Ground Combat System, with other European nations considering joining the program. In 2018, at the Euro Satori trade show, a tank with the Leclerc's turret and the Leopard 2A chassis was shown as a possible layout. So it looks like we may soon see the future of tanks in Europe. My buddy who's a Marine Corps veteran, Patrick Baker, and I just started a brand new podcast called Two Bros, One Bunker. It's on the side channel live now. If you're interested, we solve all of the world's biggest geopolitical problems with all of the intellect and finesse that you would expect from a couple of lower enlisted bros. So if you're interested, check it out. The link's in the corner in the description.